Hello and welcome to our top 10 financial ratios. This is our listing of the most commonly tested financial ratios in finance and accounting exams. Brought to you by Passing Score, where you can get more help on your exam prep at PassingScoreFinance.com. Let's start with number 10, our day sales outstanding. This is the average number of days it takes our customers to pay us back for our accounts receivable for those invoices that we've sent them out. So this answers the question is how well do we collect from our customers? How, how able are we to get our money back? And how are we managing our liquidity as well? The lower the ratio, the better. It means that we're collecting our money quickly and not having to use as much operating cash or tie up funds in our accounts receivable. This is calculated first by getting our receivables turnover, our revenue divided by our average accounts receivable. In this case, if our revenue was 850,000 and our average receivable was 45,000, we would have 18.9 or almost 19 times turning over those accounts receivable. This then goes into our day sales outstanding formula. We take the days in the year uh, and divide by our receivables turnover of 18.9 to get 19.3 days on average it took us to collect our money. This can also be calculated by taking our accounts receivable and dividing by our net credit sales, which would have to be uh, kept track of separately in our financial statements and multiplying by 365, but we should get the same answer. Number nine on our list is return on assets, a key indicator for how well the firm is managing the investments made by the company. It's the profit generated by the firm's assets. And so we're asking what is the return that we're getting? So the higher the number, the better. Uh, our ROA is calculated by taking the net income and dividing by our average total assets. So in this case, 128,000 divided by 895,000 of assets means that we were getting a 14.3% return, which is pretty strong. ROA can also be calculated by taking our net profit margin times asset turnover of the firm. Number eight on our list is return on equity. So in this case, similar to ROA, we're looking at the return, but on the shareholder investment, not on the total assets. So we want to know how is management, management making use of the investment, the equity that I'm providing to the firm, and how much income is actually generated for every dollar of income that I get, uh, every dollar of investment that I make. An ROE of one means that I'm gonna make $1 of net income for every dollar of equity invested in the firm. And we calculate this by taking our net income minus preferred dividends, we're looking at common shareholder amounts, and dividing by our shareholder equity. So in this case, we have 1.2 million of net income minus $150,000 of preferred dividend payments and dividing by $5.8 million of equity to get an 18% ROE. Again, a pretty strong number. ROE can be broken down so that we can look at the components and see what's contributing to a strong or weak ROE number. We can take our net income divided by sales, our sales divided by assets, and our assets divided by equity together to get to our ROE and we can see in there the components uh, that are making up either a strong or a weak number and why. Number seven on our list is inventory turnover, a key figure for manufacturers and retail businesses. It's the number of times that our inventory gets turned over or sold during a period. So we want to look at how uh, this is looking at how well is inventory managed? Is it sitting on the shelves too long or is it getting turned over quickly, used and converted into cash quickly, which is tying into how liquid is the inventory of the firm? And the higher the turnover ratio, the better, the more that we're selling off the inventory and turning it into cash over and over again. 
the calculation is the cost of goods sold, the amount that we're paying for our inventory, divided by our average inventory level. Uh, in this case, a turnover of 3.8 means that our inventory is sitting for almost three months uh, at a time, which may be good for a large manufacturing or construction, something like that, but not very good for something like retail. Number six on our list is a debt to equity ratio. So here we're looking at the leverage of the firm, how much debt they're using to get their results. Uh, so a key question this uh, answers is how much leverage risk is there? Is their debt to equity high or low compared to peers in their industry? And how much could the firm borrow if they need to? If they have a very high debt to equity ratio, they might not have as many people willing to lend to them uh, if they need additional cash. Some debt is reasonable, acceptable, can actually increase the return to the shareholders, but after a certain level, the risk just gets too high and it decreases the flexibility of the firm to operate. Our debt to equity is simply taking our total debt or liabilities on the financials divided by our total equity. In this case, we get a 1.8 which means that we have a dollar and 80 cents of debt for every $1 of equity that we have in the firm. Number five on our list is the times interest earned, the amount of income available to make debt payments in terms of how many times could we make those debt payments. So how financially secure is the firm and how many times could the, does, the, does the firm make debt income above its debt payments. So the higher the ratio, the more financially secure is the firm. In this case, we take our earnings before interest and taxes divided by our interest expense. In this case, we have an 11.8, which is a very strong uh, ratio. Number four on our list is gross margin. The ratio of our uh, cost of goods sold uh, to our net sales. And so we're looking at how profitable is it when we sell in, uh, inventory and how much is available uh, beyond our cost of goods sold to pay for operating expenses. Again, a key for the flexibility as well as the profit, profitability of the firm. Uh, so we get a higher ratio by decreasing or reducing our cost of goods sold, our inputs, and increasing our sales price. If we're able to maintain a high margin, high sales prices, uh, we're in pretty good shape. So we calculate this by taking our gross margin in dollars and dividing by our net sales. In this case, 718 million divided by 1.2 billion would be a 60% gross margin ratio, which in most industries would be very strong. Our gross margin in the calculation is taking the net sales minus cost of goods sold. Uh, that's our gross margin. And our net sales is the gross sales less returns and refunds. So the amount that we actually get to keep uh, after everybody's had a chance to return or refund our product. Number three on our list is earnings per share, a key indicator for investors. It's the net income divided by uh, the number of shares uh, outstanding in the market. Uh, and this is looking at how much profit is there for shareholders in their earnings. And if you look at the history of the earnings per share, how stable is the net income for my prospective investment in this company? The higher the number, the better, but there can be a lot of manipulation or accounting uh, issues that could obscure the numbers. Uh, so it's not always clear because of the accounting what's going on. Uh, if we look at our calculation, we take our net income. Again, this is accounting income, not economic value or cash flow, and minus preferred dividends. Again, we're looking at the common shares and dividing by the weighted average common shares outstanding. So on average, how many common shares were there? In this case, we get 66 cents per share which would be strong or weak depends on uh, how much the share price is. So let's take a look at that comparison in number two, our PE ratio, a very commonly used uh, financial ratio, not just in the exams, but in the financial press and in evaluating companies. 
It's a comparison of those earnings that we saw to the actual market share price that's uh, being traded out there. So it's looking at how is the market valuing the stock? Are they Do they see strong prospects, stable or weakening? And how many times earnings should I pay for this stock? Uh, is this a growth company or is this strong compared to the industry or weak? Uh, it depends on uh, one thing you can look at is the P.E. ratio. A lower number indicates that there's poor or flat prospects, while a higher P.E. ratio means there's expectations that there's strong earnings growth in the firm. A P.E. ratio is taking the market share price, what's being traded, and dividing by the earnings per share we calculated in number three. So in this case, we'll have a $12 share price divided by $4.87 of uh, earnings per share would get us a P.E. ratio of 2.46, which would not be very strong. And finally, number one, our most commonly used financial ratio is a current ratio. It's the ability of the firm to meet its short-term obligations. In this case, short-term is anything that would mature or come due within one year. So we're looking at how liquid are the firm's assets and can the firm meet its short-term obligation? Can it meet their payments? Are they looking strong or like they might need help? Uh, it's a good indicator of their liquidity and also the efficiency of manage management in uh, managing the payments and assets of the firm. Uh, higher is better and implies ability to manage their debt. It doesn't tell us a lot about the overall debt structure of the firm since we don't see the long-term debt, long-term obligations, which could be huge or insignificant. Uh, we take the current assets, divide by the current liabilities. And again, these are due or maturing within one year or expected to turn into cash in one year. In this case, 253,000 divided by 98,000 means we could cover our li liabilities about 2.6 times. Well, that's it for our top 10 financial ratios. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at john at passingscorefinance.com. And as always, good luck on your exam.